Okay, I think we're good to go. So hi everyone and welcome to our first online Kubernetes meetup in 2021. My name is Caroline. I'm a marketing manager at Kubernetes, and um, I'm excited about this yeah, kind of special session tonight. Um, um, Cause yeah, we um, decided to make this a little bit more interactive instead of just uh, rather having a one woman show and just uh, going through the presentation slide by slide. So we decided, yeah, to make this a, bit, a little bit more interactive and to provide you with some space for your own ideas and contributions on how to get involved in open source. I'm very happy to welcome Divya. Um, she will be guiding you through the session today. She will be moderating and answering your questions. So. Um, yeah, nice to have you here tonight. <laughs> um, all right, before we get started, um, I'd just like to say a few words about Kubernetes. I think some of you might know us already since we are hosting a few meetup groups here. Um, but for those of you who haven't heard about Kubernetes yet, just here now, a rough overview. So at Kubernetes, we develop enterprise grade software solutions and provide professional services and support to safely navigate and accelerate the cloud native um, transformation. And in strong commitment to make Kubernetes as boring as possible, we want to empower IT teams worldwide to fully automate the management of hundreds of thousands of Kubernetes clusters across any infrastructure. What else might be interesting? Um, we are a remote first company with um, a team of yeah, nearly something over 60 employees at the moment um, across Europe and the whole world. But nevertheless, our heart is beating for Hamburg. So we have a headquarter based in this beautiful city in the north of Germany. Um, we are very proud to be um, the number six of the top committers to the Kubernetes project. And what else? Um, our project or our products are open source and freely available. So if you're interested, if you want to find out more, check out our GitHub open source projects. And um, yeah, <laughs> I think that's enough marketing stuff for today. Um, now handing over to Divya and to start the session. So hello everybody, and I'm really. Um, uh, glad that all of you could join today. And uh, to be honest, I'm also a little shocked that uh, so many folks are joining in um, because uh, for a lot of folks, it's late uh, after their respective work, work hours. And I'm, uh, you know, be astounded that folks have had the opportunity to join in and, you know, listen to me speak about uh, this um, open source. But uh, before I get started uh, with my introduction and the session at uh, lunch, I just want uh, this to be as interactive as possible. There will be no slides, and that still is my promise. Um, but uh, should you want to speak um, um, and you know respond to questions or ask me any questions, please use the reactions um, uh, call reactions uh, button that is there, and there's a raise hand uh, section there. Please use that, and um, I'll uh, unmute you once. Um, you know, you use that feature. So uh, we are going to be talking about a lot of stuff and uh, this is to make it as interactive as possible. And everybody uh, should, you know, have their opportunity to go ahead and be part of the discussion. So please use the raise the hand feature when you want to sort of chime in or uh, start a sort of discussion on your own. Um, that being said, uh, those are just the ground rules, but um, uh, coming back, I'm Divya and I work with HSBC in my day job. And um, over the last year, I one of my primary goals was to get involved uh, more in the open source community, uh, primarily because uh, for, I wanted to understand more about uh, Kubernetes as a product rather than, you know, just using it and firing commands and uh, learning how to administrate it. My interest was because of that. And um, fortunately, I also had the opportunity to be part of a larger 
um, uh, ecosystem of uh, cloud native uh, products, which includes uh, Litmus Chaos, a tool for cloud native chaos engineering. And uh, my contribution journey was uh, really uh, not standard because most of it um, did not start from, I mean, none, none of it actually uh, revolves around coding or uh, knowledge of programming languages, to be honest. Um, and uh, why I personally was motivated to conduct this sort of a discussion was on account of the fact that there's a lot of interest around open source and there's a lot of interest around how we need to get how we want to get started um but there's even with the amount of resources videos contribution guides whatever uh, that's available on the internet um there's still no one stop shot for everything uh it's there is no one stop shot for uh, how you can get started based on where you are today and uh, hopefully from this discussion, uh, you're able to take away some pointers to get you started with the journey and, um, you know, hopefully sustain that in the longer run towards uh, making more meaningful contributions and building your own um, community of sorts around you. So that, that was my motivation for starting, I mean, for having this uh, particular event. And, um, if there's anyone who um, anyone who currently contributes to uh, open source who would like to sort of share their journey or um, share more their contributions, well, y'all can you know use the raise the hand feature and uh, I'll allow. I mean, I can allow y'all to unmute yourself. Mm. Oh, okay, over to you. Yeah, I'm. I just like to ask uh, because you've mentioned that you work at HSBC, which is, I think, a couple of trillions worth of company and uh, the group, and uh, you adhere to a lot of regulations. And uh, how did you convince your bosses that uh, you would be able to spend working time on contributing to open source? Basically, that is my question how to get the reasoning done once uh, yeah i'm working at the big company as well and of course there are some challenges that uh, yeah basically understaffing so on and so forth and how to i don't know build a case with your employer that okay uh, the um, the benefit overweights the cost of my working time especially when the i don't know the team is uh, in a bad situation or something like that. Okay, that's a very good start off um, point. And uh, honestly, that was something I was hoping uh, to cover in the very first uh, section, but uh, thank you for raising it. So um, to be honest, when I start off my open source journey, um, I really uh, told my manager that I am involved um and i am planning to be involved in this particular community because we were adopting um uh, we were adopting kubernetes and we are the support team for kubernetes at this point so um that's uh, that sort of helped give me the uh, weight to the uh, you know point that i had to make to my, my own manager saying that um I understand that if you do not want me to sort of um, do this, but um, most of what I do is outside of my working hours. It's not during my working hours, but there will be some time spent. A. Um, secondly, I also managed to convince him in this uh, way that um, we had an honest discussion about this, uh, saying that we um, we are going to be adopting Kubernetes and I am interested in learning more about it as a product rather than just, like I said before, um, hitting commands, uh, just, um, I mean, uh, creating clusters, uh, doing the configurations, all of that is normal. Like everybody can uh, learn how to start up a Kubernetes cluster by just referring to a website. 
but uh, what are the rational uh, decision making processes behind the um, conception of such a product what uh, what what makes it into the uh, product and why does it become a part of the product is something i wanted to understand and honestly when uh, you are onboarding uh, we had already onboarded and this uh, support uh, was just uh, had already been you know sort of given to us so when i said that i want to learn more about a product that we were already supporting and i wanted to learn it about it from a holistic perspective um my manager was really okay with me going on board and the very first uh, a uh, sort of contribution was not even technical to be really frank um i actually was part of um a community day uh, back in um, 2020 and uh, that's that's before the virus actually and i'd heard a lot about chaos engineering and i was very interested as like this sounds like something i'd really be interested in so um what happened was that i got interested i started learning i started figuring out stuff on my own machine and um, i was like i want to give a talk about this and um, i went ahead and asked my manager i said that this is not going to be doing anything with our uh, with the stuff we support right now but i want to demonstrate stuff that i am learning and um, is it okay with uh, you as a uh, team of a huge company for me to go ahead and do this so there was there was nothing personal i mean not personal <laughs> there's nothing that uh, we work at hsbc that was spoken about but um, i was able to convey whatever i learned as part of my journey in chaos engineering in that conference talk um so i spoke at kubecon last year and uh, it's been one of the best experiences so far even though it was virtual but uh, yeah this this was basically the sort of summary of how i convinced my manager does that answer your question just to verbose i'm sorry yeah because i've experienced something different basically uh, the reasoning of the manager basically was uh, i don't know yeah how is this would be helpful you know, to the company especially where when we are in the situation i was hired as the software engineer and of course i already had knowledge of the kubernetes it was planned to migrate and basically the expectations from the managers are yeah you spawn the kubernetes clusters with terraform so on and so forth a lot of technical details i already have known that yeah and how to convince especially when they see a lot of value of me working on the specific business goals and switch that to the open source like how to convince that was uh, maybe that is a clarification of my question yeah that, this is uh, hard for me at least to reason with the manager because I, i honestly do understand their standpoint on that okay um it's it's not that sort of um you know it's not a sort of decision that uh, we as uh, individual contributors can uh, foresee uh, managers approving easily but uh, it takes a lot of convincing and honestly for me it was not as difficult because we were already sort of um, you know uh, starting off with kubernetes support so it was easier for me i um, and honestly that's that's one of the reasons i am part of the community today because without uh, that support uh, coming in from your uh, management it's not really uh, easy to sort of uh, get into open source contribution it doesn't mean that you know um, i speak about stuff as what i do at hspc but it does give me the opportunity to work on stuff other than you know just uh, my work stuff so it gives me an or exposure to other community related um affairs that i wouldn't typically have exposure to had i just sort of gotten into um my technical bubble so yeah yeah thank you um, very much thank you very much for the answer thank you um so anyone there's else there's a there's a um there's a couple of things i thought uh, was important to share um companies usually have um um a um some sort of a contract a lot of uh, large companies at least that you don't work on <clears throat> open source products 
um, which are directly competing with the products you build. Um, as long as that doesn't come uh, as a direct competitor, you're okay to contribute and uh, do what you want. That has happened. So you can actually sign those contracts that you're not working on projects or open source projects. I worked at Sun before, uh, before the acquisition from Oracle. Oracle also had the same thing. Um, um, back while I was living in Prague, um, we there was a group of engineers in the Prague office working on a uh, open source uh, microkernel, but but they all they had Unix as part of the main operating system, but they were not competing in the same category of you know supporting large hardware. But this was purely academic, and to help. Uh, students learn operating systems, contribute to projects, and understand how the open source code base works and uh, evolves. So it's very important. The second part I want to know, uh, also want to, what I've, um, this is just purely anecdotal evidence. So I'm not saying it's something which I know for a fact, but a lot of large companies like HSBC or any other large enterprises do have vested interest in supporting open source projects when they embark upon larger uh, effort in moving to a specific technology, it's important for them to actually keep it alive. If you don't have enough com community people supporting those projects and in, in, uh, putting code back in, you lose support for it, which means that it's a cost that you embark. Let's assume, you know, I'm not saying this is going to happen, say, but if you chose a open source framework to support your infrastructure and three years down the line, the community doesn't pick it up and you lose support for it. All the effort and resources you, you spent on it goes down the drain, which means you have to start looking at something new to have something alive. So that's also one reason why you choose wisely when you choose an open source project to adopt and also contribute because for instance, if you are using uh, the Elk stack for your common logging infrastructure, you know, um, look at what sort of uh, file beat sources are being supported by the community, right? Which means if you're using those technologies to run your infrastructure, you know that those will stay alive and those are kept alive by the community members. So Elk stack is a very good example, in my opinion. Kubernetes is a great example. So it's not like every open source project is going to be a big hit because like it's like another startup, right? Sometimes it gets picked up, sometimes it doesn't. But you have to choose wisely as well. Um, you know, then if you start contributing to keep that alive, it's a win-win situation, right? So it has to it it it, it uh, you have to be a little more, uh, or we all have to be a little more uh, wise about what technologies we choose to support. Um, you know, um, yeah. Uh, those are the two things I thought I should, uh, I've noticed and maybe I could share. That's an amazing point. Thank you, Suresh, for chiming in. Um, honestly, um, I, I completely agree with you. And uh, I think um, what we choose to see more of is what actually gets, uh, you know, promoted and what sort of get, gets, uh, you know, more visible in, um, anywhere not just open source so that's that's some um, that's something that i really uh, think we should all put a thought to uh, before going ahead and starting contributions as well so yeah that's that's a very good point thank you um anybody else would like to ask any question or share details about their contributions journey Uh, I, act, I actually would like to ask one question about time. How, how you allocate your time to spend on this like uh, part-time or the hobby open source project? Because I, I started several times to get to know the project. Sometimes the project is pretty big. Then <clears throat> uh, I spend time to read like this uh, document, then to build, a, build up the local development, start my PR. Then, But the problem is after while then I have to switch to uh, so for my day job or for my private life I'm pretty busy then I come back in two months then lot things have changed I have to start again so this happened again and again so sometimes I just quit so I started the first month then I'm busy with other things doing business trade for a very long time when I come back to continue my topic then I think I found out the community also involved a lot I missed a lot of the uh, 
theoretically discussion. So this is always my my problem. So I don't know how to keep on track on this uh, changes in open source communities. Why you possibly only spend the time in the weekend or the night time to to do the to do this open source uh, work. Okay, so uh, to answer your question, um, like I said before, I do not do it. Um, I mean, I do part of it during my working hours because right now we are all afforded that uh, comfort uh, owing to work from home uh, for most of us. So that's, that's one thing that uh, work from home afforded me uh, to uh, be part of because uh, it's, it's possible to do both both things for me at the same time. Context switching is one thing, but that's that's a completely different topic. Um, the bit about contributions where you're not able to sustain because you're not um, sort of able to give the time commitment. Um, I would say that in my personal opinion that uh, even with the busiest of personal lives and the busiest of professional uh, commitments, uh, what works for me personally is to uh, sort of understand where my strengths lie and where I can contribute the best. Again, that comes down to narrowing down where um, uh, what you want to contribute to. Even within Kubernetes, there are a lot of things you could contribute to and it's not necessary that you need to make a code contribution or you need to make a, a documentation related contribution or you need to do X, Y, Z to uh, sort of valuably contribute. Every small contribution counts. And it's it's honestly a matter of um, directing your focus to what you would like to do and um, going ahead and slotting out time, uh, maybe across a week uh, as to how you would distribute uh, time across a week for that particular contribution and getting it done in that slot. Yeah, as opposed to just pre-falling and uh, expecting it to work according to um, you know your convenience, because it ne never works that way. And having a sort of shit, um, rough idea about um, the bandwidth that you can allocate over a week and slotting the week into um, diff uh, you know different time slots where you can contribute make sense in the longer run because every day is, it's really not possible for us to be online 24 7 checking stuff on um the work slack the kubernetes slack the um you know work whatsapp everything it's not possible it's too much information overload for me personally and i'm sure that's the case with everyone so if if you actually speak about time management it's more about distributing your work in such a way across the week uh, or across a period of time that you intend to contribute and you think you'll be able to get it done by that time slot it, direct your focus onto that and don't spend extra time on that after that particular time slot gets done because the more you expend work, uh, the more you expend time on that particular, um, um, you know, outside of that particular slot, the more you are going to go deeper and then it will be outside of um, you know that um, you know slot that you've set for yourself, and you are going to definitely not consider it sustainable, and it's it's going to be easy for us to drop out. It will be very easy for us to drop out and feel unmotivated because we're not able to live up to our own expectations of contributing. So the best way in this case is to slot it out across a period of time, judge what you're firstly going to do, and then. Uh, go ahead and do it because there's there's honestly not a lot uh, not a lot you can say because uh, for personalized uh, guidance and all of that it's it's very difficult given that no two days are ever going to be the same um, and no forget about days I don't even think no uh, the uh, art that has gone and the art that is going to come is going to be the same so it it makes sense for you to have a very rough plan about what your uh, focuses and to sort of uh, have that have a specific time in a day or a couple of days across the week for that particular thing only um, and then you can you know have more focus in that area and uh, you know go in a t-shaped manner to uh, allocate things I mean uh, towards you know developing uh, focus on other things 
but first i think getting focus in a particular area is absolutely essential does that answer your question yeah yeah i think so so you mean you have to focus on one area then you just try to find some time slot in your spare time then see how can you contribute it i think that, that makes sense indeed yeah maybe i have a small addition addition what uh, i would like to share with how what uh, personally worked for me basically a calendar um, that uh, you oh, dedicate i don't know the time slot that if you have 15 minutes it's 15 minutes but every day every work day or whatsoever and as early as possible in the beginning so you woke up you get a trigger that you have to do something and if you've done done that uh, you already feel better for yourself that you've done it uh, in the morning and you have more energy during the time and uh, more and more it's the same like with I don't know, reading a book for one hour per day or something like that. Basically, you would just uh, get more and more disciplined with that and uh, you would be able to, I don't know, dedicate time slots in the evening and you would be adhering to your schedule. This is what helped me, I don't know. Uh, so, so that means you, you do that in the morning, you mean? At least I don't know how it would be the best for you. This is at least what helped me personally. Like uh, it worked for me. Uh, I have a goal that uh, I don't know. I dedicate 15 minutes or 30, 30 minutes, not for contributing to open source. It's a completely different subject, but doing it uh, like uh, every day and at the same time helped me to develop a schedule. And then, uh, then you, I don't know, if you invest one hour per day, so it's seven hours per week, so you would uh, reach, I don't know, um, hundreds of hours in a year, so on and so forth. Uh, yes, yes, that's right, yes. No, um... If uh, we do know where we, uh, where we can allocate and where we uh, choose to allocate, we probably all have stumbled on uh, this problem as to where to begin. Because that's the problem with uh, Kubernetes or actually any open source project, to be honest. Uh, the ecosystem is largely um, not, um, I mean, it's documented well. It, that is not the problem, but uh, the problem is more around uh, how to navigate it and where to begin. So when I started off, I had a lot of help uh, with respect to the, um, you know, navigating and hand uh, handholding um, uh, into a particular community. So um, I, I spoke to a lot of members and uh, understood my um, strengths. I mean, strengths I, I had to assert it for myself, but understanding where I could effectively contribute was something that I asserted after uh, speaking to a lot of members. And uh, I think that's, that's something I would like to understand if folks are actually contributing is there uh, some sort of... Um, uh, you know, um, how to begin, where to begin, dilemma that uh, you all have faced when starting off. Could I say something, please? Excuse me. Yes? Okay. Yes. Uh, 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 hello, hello, Divya. You have introduced yourself as a senior sysadmin at HSBC. Are you talking for HSBC or for yourself right now? Because I have not understood that. 
So I work at HSBC, uh, Demetrius, if I'm getting the name correct. Uh, but uh, this, I'm, I'm nothing of this is affiliated with my job at HSBC. I am uh, speaking from my experiences uh, with regards to the open source community contribution uh, and how I personally managed it. Um, HSBC, uh, so fair disclaimer, I should have given this earlier on, fair disclaimer. Um, HSBC is not sponsored this. HSBC um, is not responsible for my views. These are my experiences and these are my opinions. And uh, these are what I have uh, gone through. Um, and I hope to share. I, and what I aim to get out of this discussion is better clarity for all of you all uh, to get started with open source community contributions. Does that clarify your time? Hi, Divya. I also have a question over here. So can I ask now? Sure, sure, please. Yeah. So uh, so once you get started with uh, contributing to the open source, and uh, there could be some uh, situations where you face difficulties, or uh, there is a problem, like you have taken up some task, and now you find it difficulty to uh, find it difficult to finish it off. So how do you communicate with the members or uh, with other colleagues? in this project or in this open source community thing? OK, that's a very good question. And uh, honestly, one of the things that I was looking to cover, um, so when I uh, hit a roadblock, and honestly, I when I started off, I hit a roadblock pretty soon, uh, given that I was, um, I was pretty much a newbie to a lot of the things we were talking about. So um, uh, what I understood and what I have experienced personally is that uh, when you are working on an issue, um, there will be a person who has actually opened the issue and is responsible for uh, sort of coordinating with the assignee to get the work done. And uh, coordinating not necessarily in the sense that you will be uh, asked for a particular uh, date and time when you uh, when you're going to be completing and not in that way but uh, the person that i reached out to uh, in all of the contributions that i have done is the person who has uh, actually raised the issue and um, it it can be over the pr but uh, normally i find it more effective that uh, we get on uh, we get on board the uh, not necessarily a Zoom call, but uh, we have that one-on-one -on -one interaction either on Slack or whatever the internet, I mean, whatever the um, chat format your uh, open source project uh, uh, uses. So that is one thing. Second thing is obviously PR is a very good way to interact and uh, getting on board the Slack channel is also great. But uh, if you want a wider uh, attention, um, I mean, you, you want a wider uh, area of attention and you want more people to understand and help you. Uh, my best bet would be uh, to join the meetings that are there for that particular uh, focus group. So every issue or uh, every uh, sort of uh, focus, uh, I mean, every issue that is raised on GitHub specifically for Kubernetes and uh, um, Litmus Chaos, the two projects that I work on, they are uh, tagged to different special interest groups or focus groups, as you may call them, uh, within the community. So um, all of these community um, and all of these groups have calls that are held fortnightly or weekly. And uh, we are very welcoming to open contribute, I mean, to newer contributors so that uh, they have an open forum to discuss about their problems, about their roadblocks. And uh, uh, the people on the call are obviously more experienced folks who can guide them in that, in the correct direction. So 
that is another way that i personally found helpful when i started off because um like i said i was i was completely new to kubernetes and moreover i was really new to um, github and or the version control system because i was not a, a developer so to say i did not use github in my day to day job so learning uh, the learning curve for me was very steep and uh, a lot of the guidance that i got along the way was uh, by these methods that i just told you does that make sense does that clarify your question yeah yeah so basically when we take a task or something then we are not on our own self there will be someone who is more coordinating and uh, who will also help in throughout the path yeah 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 that typically is the case because uh, folks mm -hmm. who open uh, issues or folks who are actually uh, responsible for uh, making any sort of changes to the existing packages are typically more experienced folks and they are the mm -hmm. ones who are responsible uh, for um, tagging an issue and uh, labeling it across um, the special interest groups or whatever that I was talking the groups that I was talking about so that is done at least in um, the two projects that i'm part of and i've also noticed it in python so i think that's that's a very widely used format across open source projects that people have better visibility um, as to where and who to reach out to so you're never quite alone in this regard i guess and okay. that's yeah and one more point that when you started you said that you want to understand kubernetes as a product and not uh, okay also like uh, a technical terms so what do you mean by the kubernetes as a product like uh, does it go in the direction of marketing or uh, promotion something like that or no. it is more into the how it integrates with the system no so um honestly what i wanted to understand was um when we are talking about um, every kubernetes version there is a decision making process that goes on behind the scenes that's not very well um, um i mean it's well documented for folks who know about it but it's not so widely available on the um, um you know as as common uh, knowledge on the internet like it's there it's there on github all of it is there but it's just not uh, something that everybody is aware of so what i wanted to understand was uh, when when a kubernetes version uh, is released what are the considerations that go in um, and what are the decision making processes what are the exact um, you know uh, coordination processes that go go into effect once you decide that that particular release is going in and uh, i wanted to understand it from a holistic perspective because i have been part uh, in my previous job um of a uh, release uh, support administration team and i was curious about uh, the product as a whole so that that is one aspect second thing obviously community uh, is something i was curious about because um, it, it's it's kind of stunning to me that uh, there's no contractual obligation here to contribute whatever you do is voluntary so i wanted to see how the governance and how um the policies around such a uh, community um you know functions because uh, it's very easy when you have contractual obligations that stuff is there in black and white and uh, you know that you are obligated to do x y z in this time at this place and you are expected to deliver so and so but uh, when you are actually not doing uh, when you actually have no obligations whatsoever so this is all of just a voluntary exercise how does that work and that sort of those two are the main reasons that got me you know started on my contribution journey make sense yeah thank you i mentioned And maybe sorry for I don't know asking too many questions. Uh, no. um, do you participate in the Hacktoberfest from the Digital Ocean? Basically, it is an event that happens each October, and you basically optimize your 
uh, GitHub repositories for the first time contributors? Like, do you participate in that? And what's your ideas on the subject? So um, I personally have not participated in that because uh, to be really honest, I um, was I was aware of it uh, as a thing that was uh, there, but I was not sort of, um, I had a major imposter syndrome that I would not be effectively able to contribute and um, uh, it sort of never goes away something I've learned. So um, uh, Hacktopus Fest is something I've never really contributed to. And um, my plan is to actually uh, work actually to start uh, contributing last year. But um, as fate would have it, I uh, flipped onto the other side because we, I was part of a project that uh, sort of had Hacktober Fest, um, was participating in Hacktober Fest. So you could say that I participated, but from the other side. So I didn't get a chance to contribute, but uh, I was one of the folks that was there on the reviewing and approving side for pull requests to the project. So I was on that side. Unfortunately, did not get to contribute um, to anything. Does that make sense? Sure, yeah, thank you. Hey, I've, I've participated both as a maintainer and as a participant in Hacktoberfest. This year was a little bit funky because there yeah. was a strong spam uh, presence just before it started. And so we had to change the infrastructure slightly. Yeah. Um, as a maintainer and a participant, it wasn't that hard to change to, uh, to accommodate that. Um, I personally, I come from an open source background. I worked for Red Hat for a long time. I'm, I'm, I'm very privileged when it comes to open source participation. It's, it is my job. Um, but I think that Hacktoberfest is a beautiful initiative for, especially for beginners. Um, it's very inclusive and welcoming. And, and I was really impressed with how, especially this year, the adjustment was quickly made, quickly addressed. Yeah. And the rest of Hacktoberfest was um, very chill. Yeah, it was super smooth after that um, adjustment was done. So I completely agree with that. Uh, although the uh, initial phase of it was like a lot of spam. Um, and by spam, I don't even mean like the spam you receive in your email box. I mean, mailbox on Gmail or whatever. It was like a truckload of spam unloaded on you on one single day. And all of us wake up to a really huge amount of notifications, let's say. So yeah, and that after the regulations were put into effect and the tweaks were made, I think it was perfectly fine after that. But yeah. So um, uh, apart from the factable fests and apart from um, you know the open source uh, programs that um, I mean open source communities that I mentioned. Um, has anyone uh, been part of any programs or any, um, how do you say that, programs really, uh, because I don't think there's a better word for that. Um, I know that most of the programs on um, the internet that are there very um, widely, uh, that are widely actually um, available and widely publicized are aimed at students, but uh, have you all been fortunate enough to be part of programs that are not? Like mentoring programs. Um, I mean, I will I'm one of the people who fixes those complaints <laughs> when something does go wrong in a couple of different um, projects. Uh, but it's not uncommon for there to be uh, bad experiences in a mentoring situation. Um, but that's true also in, in private 
sectors and, and everywhere. Um, and hopefully, um, by the way, if you're getting involved in open source for the first time, one of the um, signals you can look for that indicates kind of a safer space or a not a safe space is if there is a code of conduct. Um, if that code of conduct doesn't exist, um, it uh, proceed cautiously. I won't, I've, okay. I've seen projects that did not have a code of conduct that were perfectly fine. It tends to be uh, smaller projects or, or projects where they just didn't think it was important and everyone knew everyone, but um, at a certain point, um, when a project gains certain attention, it can it can become necessary. It's like a car with no seatbelts. You you want the seatbelt there when you crash, but otherwise you're kind of annoyed that you have to wear this thing all the time. Um, and I get it, but uh, but yeah, hopefully, if you are in a situation where you don't have a mentor who is unresponsive or um, worse that you know who you can talk to within the project um usually of the maintainers list um or the founders list is a good place to go um but try to get really uh factual like if you want if you if you're have a mentor that's unresponsive say uh, something along the lines of, I was expecting a response within a week via email. This is the contact we agreed on rather than just saying, this person never talks to me um, because then uh, people are better able to communicate and get to the source of an issue um, because everything's online. <laughs> um, you know, you kind of forget there's a person behind that text, someone who's going to read it. And, uh, and so I, I think it's important to remember that you're all people and, and to communicate above all else. Also, I think it's very important to pick the proper chunk of your first contribution or something like that. So you are not spending I don't know, weeks of work and then trying to convince everybody that you've, I don't know, reinvented everything. But yeah, this is basically my observation that uh, you have to have a mentor or a reviewer who would later, uh, I don't know, merge everything to the master and uh, yeah, help you to navigate how to maybe fix a bug or fix the documentation or something like that, making a first step. And then, yeah, you will be doing second step, third step, so on and so forth. Absolutely. Um, I think having, uh, like uh, Rain said, having that uh, code of conduct is extremely essential uh, when you are going on a larger scale, uh, primarily because, um, it, it designates a safe space and it also sort of gives you the reassurance that, um, you know, things, if things go wrong, you will be held liable, that that bit is there. And it's, it's a nice thing to feel that sort of safety when you are uh, contributing to something that's also very voluntary and is, there's no other obligatory, uh, you know, uh, obligations written down and in the form of a contract or whatever. So that, that sort of safe space is extremely essential. And having a mentor, like an official mentor on a program is, I think, one of the most valuable things. Um, any of the programs uh, that are there, like even GSOC, uh, Google Season of uh, Docs, OutPG, whatever, um, any of them can sort of provide, even Hacktoberfest for that matter. But um, uh, they are, they are uh, pretty good contact points. And uh, should you not know really who to speak to, like again, Rain really well, uh, chipped in really well, um, that uh, maintainers are always great folks to speak to. So feel free to reach out. Um, and the maintainers list is normally pretty well uh, maintained and updated. So you should not have a problem finding uh, that on 
the GitHub repo for the open source community that you work with. So um, when we speak about um, uh, in mentoring programs or anything in general, um, there's, there's this common, uh, I mean, imposter syndrome is one way to put it, but there's this common um, thing that goes on in our heads that we, we're not really, uh, you know, cut out for contributing to open source because we don't have expired knowledge. And uh, that's that's something I battled with because um, I, uh, as aforementioned, was not really proficient in programming. And um, being a systems administrator, senior systems administrator for maybe eight plus years of my career, uh, it, it wasn't a great place to start from at that point because I had basic programming knowledge uh, from my graduation years. And uh, imposter syndrome is, um, Unfortunately, not the greatest uh, thing to have when you are trying to start out something new. So how, uh, you know, I'm, I'm curious if folks are, you know, contributing right now and, uh, you know, have gone through that, how did you all sort of get through this whole situation? So I think I hear the question. <laughs> so to rephrase it, whenever we start contributing, um, at least in my case, what had happened was that in my years of being a systems administrator, I did not have the confidence to go ahead and contribute something in a coding perspective or to make a direct contribution to the code base, if you may. Um, and I was apprehensive if I would be, if whatever I was even contributing would be of any value. Um, and that's and that was pretty hard to overcome because um, it took a lot of uh, self-reflection, that's one thing. But it also, um, you know, helped in, you know, I mean, what helped was actually understanding how it fit in within the wider perspective. But I'm curious to understand if anybody else has, you know, sort of started their open source journey and uh, felt the same way. And if they have, uh, what, you know, what are the steps that help you feel, feel otherwise? Um, um, yeah, so there are, um, again, uh, anecdotal um, disclaimer, imposter syndrome is definitely real and tech in general um, has been um, or is still very unforgiving for women uh, in particular, not just, but in general it is. So there are the, um, um, another disclaimer, I not an active or very good contributor, but I have a uh, used a few techniques which I have uh, noticed um, it's helped people who I've been in open source communities with um, find partners um, who are champions of you know who know you well or try to um, there are two things um, one thing is attending meetups regularly so you gain some some familiarity with people and then um, the second part is filing issues with technologies start writing good bug reports uh, that gives you a lot of uh, uh, you know it builds a reputation on how well you understand things so as a user you start as a user and then you build reputation on filing good bugs so because bug reports are really the only uh, uh, you know uh, sort of pros available on how much you know about something and then I mean, for women in particular, I think it requires a group of people who, who, who they have some sort of support group, uh, which they can uh, depend on because of all the reasons you spoke about. And it all, you know, I heard before, uh, it can be un unforgiving in terms of how you get judged, uh, how you are judged to a different standard, in particular, uh, you know, all of that. Um, 
so those are important so uh, my recommendation or I, or my things what i've noticed is have somebody that can support you and and start probably with writing good bugs so that you can get build some reputation yeah also to probably extend Um, to probably extend on what Suresh was saying, um, yeah, I think another thing that we can do is look into the GitHub repository, look for issues, and look actively how people are solving that. I mean, that is something which I always go through, even though I'm not an active contributor, but when I'm writing like different controllers on top of it, I'll see how people are doing it. So it's like uh, on GitHub, uh, you can keep your identity anonymous. So it's not something which you need to feel too much ashamed of, like doing something of a contribution. Um, but to really to start small, you can um, look into how people are filing bugs, how like there are almost like 2000 open issues on like the Kubernetes repository as of yet. And if you if you go, if you go and just start clicking and looking into how people first of all are filing those bugs and then how people are doing different pull requests to solve those different bugs. I think that gives you a lot of insight of how to um, solve different issues into the community. But it's also a good idea to get an overall understanding of how Kubernetes or any open source project for that matter works under the hood. Uh, and then of course, like as you said, Divya, that how uh, just pick your, <clears throat> pick your area of interest and then contribute accordingly yeah all right i want to ask question from another perspective so this meetup is about how how people get themselves ready to join open source projects but from another side i want to ask not so many open source projects even a famous one was with a lot of people participating in the project and are organized in such a way that easier for new member to adopt the task, the, get, get started in the project. So I remember, I, I have seen some projects have this new <clears throat> new member document, but normally, let's, see, let's think a, a project in company, normally they have this complete onboarding process. Then the documents and the assign mentor, then you have some uh, easier exercise in your local development, how to build a local development environment, and you have some exercise to start with, then you can ask some questions and Q and A sessions with mentor. But I don't usually see open source project has such a thing. Like, as I said before, only a few open source projects I have seen, they have this uh, like new member document. So where you can start? So sometimes I ask, how can I start? Then answer just simply say, oh, we can pick up some issues, uh, start start with, then you can do this, then, then that. Then I think this is not, um, it's not so, I'm oh, sorry. This is not so easy for new members with different background to, to participate, to join the open source project. Absolutely, I think um, that that was one of the um, roadblocks I faced when I started off, and uh, that was not also that's also because I think uh, when we start off, uh, to be honest, we uh, rather than diving deep, we dive um, we dive in a, a breadthwise fashion. We try to look at as many things as possible rather than sort of uh, looking into one thing. So when I started off, I made that mistake. Um, when uh, when I started off Kubernetes, I also wanted to do uh, 10 other things. And um, I was like, oh, okay, this also sounds interesting. That sounds interesting. This sounds interesting. And um, honestly, all of them had contribution guides. All of them, like all of the projects I've worked with so far have had new contribution, new, new contributor guides there in place. And they tell you how, what, and uh, what is the, I mean, how and what basically in terms of the GitHub pull request process. And they also tell you um, what exactly 
uh, you could start contributing to if you are relatively new. Documentation is like the safest bet across uh, projects because um, a lot of projects maintain their um, documentation in Markdown. A lot of them. I'm not saying all of them again. Um, a lot of them uh, maintain it at Markdown, and uh, that's that's why it's the lowest entry level barrier across um, most projects. So documentation is one thing, and even for documentation, uh, most of the projects have a sort of contribution guide available. So uh, taking a look at the contribution guide definitely helps. Secondly, reaching out to folks in the community is extremely important because uh, when you are starting off, you do not have the knowledge of um, how stuff works and nobody is expected to come with everything, um, you know, you're not expected to be equipped with everything on day one. So one of the things that I think helped uh, me was, you know, reading through the contributor documentation after actually someone pointed it out to me. I did not find it myself uh, because I did not take the time to actually invest and uh, I not invest the time really to um, actually research and see if there's a documentation for it. Um, and once I read through that, things were a little simple. I'm not saying, um, you know, I went from zero to 100 in the very first day, on the very first day. But uh, stuff was easier once I started, uh, once I read through it, and once I, sorry, once I figured out where I could effectively contribute. But uh, with respect to um, entry level, con uh, entry level uh, barrier that does exist, because even with documentation, you're expected to know Markdown. And Markdown, I'm not sure if um, at this point in time, anybody doesn't know, because, uh, most of us use Markdown as in some form or the other in, at some place. So I think that's something that uh, most of us are uh, aware of. So documentation is one thing that I think uh, is has the lowest entry level barrier. And uh, reading contribution guides and speaking to folks helps you understand where, uh, you know, helps lower that barrier further down. I mean, that's that's what worked for me. I'm not sure if anybody else has had a different experience and could probably chip in from the audience. If you do, please raise your hand. No, actually, that was gonna, that echoes what my normal recommendation is, which is for people to read the getting started guides and actually follow the instructions and give feedback on how they're wrong because in open source, they're wrong. <laughs> um, because it iterates so quickly, there's always a typo, there's always a mistake, there's always a, a release that's incorrect, a link somewhere. And um, filing bugs against documentation is an excellent getting started in an in a open source system. But yeah, back to you, the original question is what can a project do to help lower that barrier for people? Those getting started guides are great. A mentorship program is awesome, but it's usually not something that you need to formalize until your project gets larger. And by larger, I mean, um, to where you have at least more than one maintainer. Um, if you're a maintainer with your own repo that, you know, only your grandma looks at or whatnot, it's, you don't need a mentorship program. But if you're Apache, you better have an, a, a maintainer, a, a mentorship program. So I wouldn't worry too much about those formal programs initially. Uh, documentation is key. Um, I've got to run, but thanks so much for this session, Divya and Kubermatic. Thank you. Thank you all. Um, sorry for interrupting now, <laughs> but we are running out of time. Um, Thank you very much all. Uh, thank you, Divya, for sharing thank your you. experiences and for um, yeah providing so much insights with uh, the community. I think that was very helpful. Um, 
I think people still might have a lot of questions on how to get involved in open source, how to lower the barriers. Um, I'm quite sure, um, Divya, they can reach out to you directly um, to go through their open questions with so you. Um, but for now, we need to stop the session. Um, thank you all for joining, for contributing, and for making uh, the most out of this interactive session. That was quite nice. Um, yeah. Have a nice evening and see you all soon. And by the way, um, we recorded the session. I will upload it to our YouTube channel so um, you can watch it whenever you want to again. And um, yeah, that's it. Thank you. Thank you. Bye, guys. Thank you. Nice evening. Bye-bye. Bye. Thank you. <laughs>